being the teacher for the figure of parameters. Thank, thank you so much, Paolo, and uh, thank you everybody for listening in today on uh, this Friday afternoon or evening. And uh, thank you, Sebastian, for, and one for coordinating. Um, I'd like to thank my fellow Solomon who helped me put some of these slides together and I'll be going over some imaging features of jugular foramen lesions. Um, <clears throat> can you guys hear me okay? Paolo, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Because the voice was very low. So today I'll be, you know, we're gonna be talking about some complex anatomy. And um, whenever we're talking about the Petrus bone, there's there's a lot of neurovascular structure. We've seen a lot of this already on, on beautiful videos, beautiful dissections. And what we have to be able to do as surgeons is to sort of predict some of those patterns, predict some of those, um, the you know, where the nerves are, are um, pushed either medially, laterally, um, what bony structures are missing. Because a lot of times when you have um, pathologic uh, anatomy, you don't really have what you should be seeing, right? We saw a lot in the, in the dissections of what we should see, but that's not always what we find in surgery. So we have to be able to look at all of our imaging modalities to start with, to be able to determine what's happening to these normal structures. So CT is particularly useful when we're talking about jugular foramen lesions as the bony changes not only helps us with the diagnosis of the tumors, but also allows us to sort of um, see uh, the landmarks and where they're, uh, which approach we can take. And also calcifications within tumors may lead us one, one direction or another in terms of diagnosis. MR also has better sensitivity for soft tissue components um, and also allows us to identify where the tumors are extending and then relationship to critical structures and in particular looking at the vasculature as well. You can use um, other um, radionucleotide imaging, um, such as octreotide or dotatate scans. Um, that can be helpful um, as a confirmatory test and also to assess for distance and metastases. This is particularly important for our paraganglioma, paraganglioma lesions. And then um, don't forget that, again, we're looking at the neurovascular structure. So in particularly, we're not only focusing on the arteries here, but we need to also look at the venous structures, which are critical. And I think some of the previous talks really highlighted that. Um, and gold standard, as always, when we're looking for this, angiography can give us a dynamic view of, um, you know, what's going on uh, in the anatomy and how that's changed. And if you think about it, a lot of these tumors that we'll be talking about today is also, there. these are slow-growing, benign lesions oftentimes. And so there are a lot of changes that occur, particularly in the venous system, that the angiography is, is very critical for. And I'll show you some of that. And then obviously for paragangliomas, we uh, preoperatively can use angiography and uh, embolization as a tool to make the surgery uh, go a little bit too smoother. So, um, uh, so the as we know, we talked about this. It, the it's, the jugular foramen is really formed by the petrous bone as well as the condylar occipital condyle, um, and it's separated really intermediately by the parotid uh, to the parotid canal for, uh, by the parotid jugular spine and inframedially from the hypoglossal canal by the jugular tubercle. And when you're looking at uh, coronal, this is a little bit um, uh, pushed off, but you can see that the jugular foramen is here on the same image that you see uh, the dens at C2. Um, so we talked, uh, the other speakers have gone over this. We have the pars nervosus, which is slightly smaller and anterior, as well as the par, uh, pars venosum uh, vascularis, excuse me, which is slightly poster, uh, poster lateral. We talked about what the components of these. It's important um, to be able to uh, understand and know that the two compartments are separated by this fibrous uh, septum or the jugular spine. It's very clearly seen on CT imaging, and I'll show you a bit better image of that. Here you can see it on a, on a, on a bony specimen. And so here's the pars nervosa. We can see it uh, located here, both in the coronal and then the sagittal pain. And then we can go to the par vascularis, most, more posterolaterally larger, very clearly seen on CT imaging. So, so preoperative thin cut CTs in particular can be very helpful. So just to go over some more of this anatomy, we talked about how this carotid uh, jugular spine separates the uh, jugular foramen from the carotid canal anteriorly. Hopefully you guys are able to see my arrows here. Um, important to also keep in mind the relationship to the facial nerve, which we talked about that becomes important. Some um, tumors that uh, are going to uh, in, that are going to invade more laterally, they can affect uh, facial nerve function, and, and I think uh, Linda's going to go over the importance 
of uh, monitoring this, and then obviously, and then you also have approaches that are going to go from a lateral approach, which you have to take the facial nerve in its course and it, um, uh, into consideration. Um, so uh, you can see here that the jugular foramen is located superior, uh, uh, superlateral to the hypoglossal canal, and it's separated by this bridge that I told you about, the jugular spine. And you can see it here; it should be sharp. Erosion of the jugular spine on, an, on a CT really should make you think of a tumor um, in this region. And then the jugular plate, <clears throat> the jugular plate se separates the jugular bulb from the middle ear canal. We can see it here. So that's an important consideration. Um, the jugular plate here separating the jugular frame and from the middle ear canal here. On this image, we could also see um, the cochlear aqueduct, which we, uh, the other speakers mentioned as well. And uh, the uh, jugular tubercle is also medial to the jugular foramen, and that's going to be marking the junction between the condylar and the basal portions of the occipital bone. So important to keep in touch the, uh, in, in, in thought the jugular process, the jugular spine, and all these sort of uh, the jugular tubercle and all of the uh, important bony landmarks as we're thinking about what um, how the pathology is affecting um, and eroding these, these structures. So we talked about this again, the two traditional parts, um, compartments, they can be divided just by the pars nervosa and vascularis. Other um, ways to describe this is really by describing it through three anatomic compartments, um, which is the anteromedial part would be the petrosal part, the posterolateral part would be the sigmoidal part, and then the intrajugular part, which is the neural part, is in between. Um, so it's just another way to characterize this. And I think um, we also uh, had one of the speakers already mentioned this, but important to, to remember the location of the inferior petrosal sinus in between um, cranial nerves 9 and 10. And so you can see here, going into a, a little bit more detail, uh, the in, inferior tympanic canaliculus is going to be where it's going to transmit the inferior tympanic branch or Jacobson's nerve. And then the mastoid canaliculus, and you see it pointed right out here, it's very subtle, but you can see it, is going to transmit the auricular branch of the ninth nerve or Arnold's, or, or, um, Arnold's nerve. So you can see, again, if you're not looking, you may just look at the CT and you just notice these ridges, you know, and, and not think anything of it. But actually, if you can if you can have a careful uh, dissection of what the, the CT shows, you can see the, these foramen through which these nerves that, are, that we all know are important are transmitted. Um, so here is also an example of the vasculature. As we all know, the inferior petrosal sinus is going to go into venous lakes, which is eventually going to uh, drain into the medial portion of the jugular bulb. Um, so that's important to keep track of. Um, it's not, it doesn't always, uh, you know, it's going to be transmitting from the uh, cavernous sinus and it's going to empty really into the medial aspect, oftentimes uh, emptying into venous lakes pr prior to emptying into the actual jugular bulb. Um, and again, passing between cranial nerves 9 anteriorly and 10 and 11 posteriorly. So the location <clears throat> in relationship, not only to the nerves it also, but uh, from medial lateral is important. Um, one thing that's that that you should keep in mind is if you have a high riding jugular bulb, um, it may look like there, there can be a lesion there. Um, so if its roof extends above the basal turn of the cochlea, you know, this may appear um, to be uh, a tumor, but really it can just be a high riding jugular bulb. And that's pretty important from an anatomic perspective um, uh, and a surgical planning perspective. Here's an example of, uh, you know, somebody where an angiogram can come into play, uh, a young female with the uh, uh, lesion here centered around the jugular fossa. Um, and she she has a really dominant uh side uh, and if you were to do an approach of even a nicest approach in this location you could have injured this because as you can see this is the dominant side for her and and this is the contralateral side so, so this is just an example of where angiography can come into play and here's another example of a patient with a dumbbell schwannoma from the 10th cranial nerve and if you had um if you look here um the uh condylar emissary vein um, which is critical for this patient, uh, could have been in, in jeopardy had you done um, uh, an approach, uh, like a transtemporal approach. So actually, this patient ended up going two approaches because of this vascular, uh, of this anatomy noted on the angiogram in order to prevent injury to this condylar emissary band. So important uh, to keep in mind to use all the modalities, including CT, MR, and then angiography when you need it. <clears throat> 
Um, we went over some of this pathology as well. Uh, you have the um, you know, common things, which are going to be your thomus jugularis tumors, um, your phonomas, and meningiomas. Then you have sort of pseudo lesions. You know, you have to think about the jugular bulb uh, that's prominent, or just a dehiscence, a large dehiscence. Sometimes large arachnoid granulations can present this way, as well as some um, extensive thromboses. And then obviously less common, but keep this in mind that these things can present in this region as well as so there's metastases and then other primary bone tumors of this region. So um, just separating this into the same thing, we'll go over just a little bit of key uh, image findings of some of these um, these tumors for the, the uh, glomus uh, jugulari lesions. Um, here's an example of how there's this moth-eaten appearance or a permeative pattern of bone destruction, very characteristic um, on CT imaging that can be particularly helpful. And you can see here again that moth-eaten appearance of the bone is, is very traditional. Um, here's another example of that, um, of the destructive uh, moth-eaten appearance of the bone in this image. Um, MR, very, uh, very classic salt and pepper appearance, sort of like uh, the, this represents the vascular flow voids that can be seen is usually on the t 2 related image. It is important to notice that um, these, this is really typical for lesions that are larger than two centimeters. So if you have small jugular frame and schwannomas, you may not notice this salt and pepper appearance, but um, you know, for larger tumors, that's uh, it's very classic and you can see that. Um, and here's another example of, a, an, uh, of the jugular frame and tumors, and you can have that uh, appearance on MRI of salt and pepper. And then, um, uh, this is a good example of the uptreotide scan. It'll be very, it'll shine very brightly. Um, uh, the jugus, uh, jugular, globus jugular tumor arising laterally of the jugular frame. And, and uh, we talked about how the relationship to the facial nerve laterally. This is an example of one of those tumors where this moth eaten appearance extends laterally and evolve, involves the facial canal. Um, and you can see that on, on the coronal scan as well. So. This is an example of involvement of the facial nerve um, canal there. Um, this is a patient with multiple uh, paragangliomas. Again, another uh, good use of the optreotide scan is if you're looking for other, um, other tumors in this region, um, you can see that using the optreotide scan. Moving forward um, to jugular foramen and schwannomas, um, most commonly um, are arising from the ninth cranial nerve, but can arise from any of the lower cranial nerves. And their appearance is quite different from, from what we were just seeing with the uh, paragangliomas, but rather on the CT, you don't have that moth eaten, you don't have the, the starburst, of, starburst appearance, but instead you have this enlarged, smooth, uh, and sharp brain and characteristic of a slow growing schwannoma. And on CT imaging, it can appear um, isodense or hypodense. Um, and then on MR imaging, you have a more well, well circumscribed, oftentimes avidly enhancing tumor. Um, and it can have signal, low signal intensity on T1 and T2. And there's very characteristic uh, presence of intramural cysts. Um, so actually, I think I have an example coming up here uh, of this cystic appearance, okay? The cysts can have a fluid fluid level, as you can see here, this is an example of a cyst with a fluid fluid level, um, very characteristic of schwannomas. And then going forward to uh, primary jugular frame and meningiomas, they can um, form a, along the 10th, the 9th through um, 11th nerve, and they can um, form, they can be well circumscribed, but important to note that they can, there can also be this diffuse on clock enhancement uh, along um, the jugular foramen for these tumors. Um, characteristically, uh, you'll see here, this is the meningioma on the bottom, the hyperostosis um, of the bone. Um, and you can see here is another example of just like a sclerotic change within the skull base, sort of thick, diffuse um, hyperostosis of the bone there. Um, and then on MR image, uh, again, characteristically, you'll see the dural tail of meningiomas, and you'll see this centrifugal en enhancement sort of along the jugular foramen itself. Uh, and you can see that that dural thickening can, can go in many directions and can kind of extend a large way for these jugular foramen meningiomas. And here's, here are more examples of that. Um, they, there can be a large posterior fossa component. There can be um, a nice uh, plane along the brain, or it can uh, have some edema along the brain. But you can see here that coming out of the jugular foramen with a small component in there, 
and a larger component in the posterior fossa. This is very uh, uh, also typical for your jugular tubercle meningiomas, which can also cause this sort of uh, linear enhancement. Other things that can mimic um, meningiomas, you know, you have to think about neuroendocrine tumors. This is why when you're looking at imaging, it's important to also look at timing. Um, you can use things like the dotatate scan, like I mentioned, important to look at your DWI sequences um, and look for flow voids, you know, and, and these, you're not going to have any flow voids um, similar to meningiomas. And then also the timing becomes very important. Um, if you have rapid progression of a tumor, less likely to be a tumor uh, that's low growing schwannoma meningioma. So when you're looking at imaging, you also, you not only want to look at it in a, from a single time period, but you want to go back and compare it if you have any previous images, which can be helpful. Um, endolymphatic sac tumors can also um, sort of extend to this region. Uh, you can have destruction or extension into the jugular foramen, um, and it's important to, to sort of, their, their imaging characteristics can be somewhat similar to the paragangliomas, so keep that in your differential diagnosis as well. Um, and then uh, pseudo lesions, like we've talked about, a lot of these patients do present with a pulsatile tinnitus, um, and you can have high riding jugular bulb, um, as you can see in this particular patient, um, and patients will, it'll sort of look like a, a lesion in, on imaging, but in fact, it could just be a high riding jugular bulb. Um, and here's an, a big example of that. And if you notice uh, the importance of looking at your bone anatomy, this, uh, when you have an intact jugular spine, you're thinking less likely to be tumor and more likely to be normal anatomy, as opposed to um, a neoplastic uh, uh, structure, which would cause destruction of the jugular spine to some degree. And then um, aggressive appearing lesions that mimic um, uh, glomus jugularity tumors can be, um, you know, you can have chondrosarcomas, which can shine brightly on octreotide. So while your octreotide uh, and uh, somatostatin imaging can be helpful, they can also be a little bit confusing. So you have to take all of the imaging modalities into play. You shouldn't just look at one image. The MRI and the CT scan become very important. And then the other um, imaging modalities can be used to just confirm as confirmatory testing without um, forgetting to also look at you know, urine and, and serum analyses for, for lab studies. Finally, um, myeloma and plasmacytoma can also sort of mimic this, so keep that in mind, that there are some neoplastic lesions that do sort of mimic uh, some of the jugular foramen lesions, which we would normally operate on. These, this, different, this obviously would not be an operative lesion, so keep that in mind. Um, and I think we will sort of stop there to allow time for Dr. Reversa to go through his cases. Um, and... These are, this is just comparing all the different characteristics of what your normal anatomy should look like, um, a glomus granularity tumor should look like, um, schwannomas, and then finally meningiomas. Very importantly, just to keep in track of your, uh, of your normal anatomy here um, with your jugular spine, your, um, your uh, jugular um, tubercle, and then your process here. So that's it. Um, I'd like to thank the labs and my fellow, uh, my fellows in the lab, as well as my clinical fellow who sort of uh, helped gather these slides together. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great, Carolina, thanks a lot. Very nice detailed analysis of the 